Well, if you are new here, my name's Matt, and I'm an only child. If you are not new here, you did not need that word of introduction to know that I'm an only child. If there is a personality, if there was an Enneagram number 10 for only children, I would be the profile. I fit every stereotype and caricature that comes along with being an only child. So now, as uh, one who's been married to um, not an Enneagram number 10 only child, uh, and now has five children, there's been a bit of a learning curve that's come with the last 17 or 18 years. Uh, For me, case in point, would be leaving to go basically anywhere. Uh, As a child, that was a a bit of an easy undertaking. Now it seems like the work to get us moving from one place to the next always takes levels of complexity that I don't imagine, particularly if we're going anywhere for a lengthy period of time, like a week-long vacation. The work starts multiple weeks in advance with to-do lists and things to pack and uh, to ensure that everyone has the right things in the car at the right time. And then the moment of leaving, it gets crazy. We wake up and scurry around the house to round up all the things and get them in the Honda Odyssey and time to head in the right direction. And after a couple of hours of scurrying, there's that moment when all seven of us hit the seat and look at one another and say, we've done it. We've arrived. Now, there's another 30 or 45 seconds that's the space from our driveway kind of getting out of the neighborhood where invariably we forget something and come back to sit in the driveway one more time and then go get that thing. And then we look at each other and we say, we've, we've done it. But in fact, we, we haven't, right? We haven't made it anywhere. We've actually not started the real journey to wherever it is that we're going. We've not even left the driveway. And it... In the reality, there's these moments of disorientation where it's like, where were we going to begin with? Like, what was the point of all of this effort? This week, uh, in fact, probably the last number of months, have felt a good bit like that scene in the driveway. There's been no shortage of frantic activity in our world. Wide range of significant issues, race relations, politics, and pandemics, to name a few. And in that upheaval, it's easy for us to get a bit disoriented, to lose sight of where, in fact, we're supposed to be heading. So today's question, the question I want to hover over this morning's reflections from the scriptures is, what's our, what's our mission? Where are, we, where are we going? And to ask it more precisely, the question, what's your mission? Like what, what, what's driving you? What's the destination out of the driveway? For you. Now, the motive behind the question framed negatively is this. If we're on the wrong mission, it doesn't matter if we get where we're going. Or the motive behind the question framed a bit bit more positively. If we're on the right mission, then we're going to be less captivated by the world's detours. So the mission matters. I want to anchor our conversation this morning in the opening chapter of the book of Acts for a couple of uh, reasons. So you can turn there, Acts chapter 1. A couple of reasons to anchor uh, our conversation, answer that question. What's our, what's our mission? What's your mission uh, here? Uh, first would be we, we try to begin, kind of have a rhythm of first of the year, pressing pause wherever we are in our teaching series uh, to do a bit of reflection on what's the mission of the church where are we heading? What, what makes our church? What defines us? What are our values? Uh, for all of us, it's easy to get disoriented. And so we want to come back kind of at the beginning of each year to say, what's the purpose of all of this? But then rooting the conversation in Acts 1 makes sense because uh, we've been considering uh, Luke 1 and 2. And as I mentioned last week, there, there are some unique and interesting parallels in, in my understanding of Luke 1 and 2 and Acts 1 and 2. As we have the same author describing in one place the birth narrative of Jesus and in Acts 1 and 2 the birth narrative of the church. I'll try to show you a little bit more of what, uh, what I mean as these weeks progress. But let's begin reading in uh, Acts 1, verse 1. Uh, I wrote the, the first narrative. This is Luke writing. I wrote the first narrative describing the book of Luke that we've been considering. 
Theophilus, uh, about all that Jesus began to do and teach, continuing verse 2, until the day he was taken up, after he had given instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. And after he had suffered, he also presented himself alive to them with many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. Now let's press pause there before we get too deep into this passage, just to give ourselves some help in orienting uh, to the text. So remember, what we have here in verse 1 is a continuation of Luke's writing. He's writing to Theophilus, and as we considered last week, he's attempting to do, he's writing an orderly account. He's attempting to do this on the basis of research, this is, he's asking personal eyewitnesses to testify to these truths. And he's doing it with a clear stated direction. He wants to fan the flames of belief in Theophilus. This is his motive. So the, the narratives then have been preserved by God to do the same for us, for the church. The outcome is that we would all be more confident in who Jesus is and what he has done as a result of considering these narratives. And as we see here in verse 1, Jesus is the focus of this twofold book. This is the story of Jesus. In one part, he says all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he's taken up. And in the book of Acts, he's going to write what Jesus continues to do and teach through his church. So this morning, as we look at this text, I want to outline uh, our sermon four ways. I want to consider first the the past reality. So if you're taking notes, you can just put these four headers uh, down. Your small groups can consider uh, some more discussion around these this week. So the past reality, the present command, the future mission, and the final hope. Past reality, present command, future mission, final hope. And as we move through that fourfold outline, at each of those junctures, I'm going to give a corresponding so what. So past reality, so what, present command, so what, future mission, so what, as we move. So first up, the the past reality. What do we see there in verse 2? So he's writing about what Jesus began to do and teach, and then he says, until that day he was taken up, after he'd given instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. And after he had suffered, he also presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. This reads a bit like a newspaper headline, right? He's reporting some clear facts about who Jesus is and what he has done. These are bold claims that are going to frame what uh, the Apostle Paul is later going to describe as the the realities that are of first importance, the the gospel message. I'll read from 1 Corinthians 15, uh, verses 1 through 8, where the Apostle Paul is going to say, hey, what's really like the the high watermark or the first importance? What are the truth claims that matter most? This is the way Paul writes that. I want to make it clear to you, brothers and sisters, the gospel I preach to you you'd received on which you stand and by which you are being saved if you hold to the message I preached to you unless you believed in vain. For I passed on to you as of most importance what I also received. And then he defines what is of first importance. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures and that he appeared to Cephas and to the twelve and then he appeared to over 500 brothers and sisters at one time. Most of them are still alive but some have fallen asleep and then he appeared to James and then to the apostles and last of all as one born at the wrong time he appeared also to me. So what does Paul say is of first importance? That Christ is the Messiah? That he has come? that he has died, each of these being according to the scriptures, that he has been victoriously raised, and that that reality has been validated by his appearance to many. This, in many ways, is synonymous with what Luke is doing in these starting verses. He's saying there is truth about who Jesus is and what he has done. And in this first narrative, I've been attempting to validate those claims. All that Jesus did and taught. Him being the promised Messiah, come to save God's people 
from their sins. All that Jesus did, his sacrificial death and victorious resurrection, accomplishing the salvation for his people. And then his appearance over the course of 40 days, continuing to teach them about the message that he'd been given all along, this message about the kingdom of God. So, so what then? So why does this matter? Well, it matters, this past reality matters because our mission, our movement out of the driveway is compelled by the truth about Jesus Christ. Our mission is compelled by truth claims about Jesus. The message of Christianity and the, mess- the mission then of a Christian and of the church hinge on, based on, the truthfulness of who Jesus is. We're not given a philosophical text or a religious pamphlet that's ours to interpret. Rather, God sent a person His son, who taught sinners how they could be reconciled to him, how sin could be forgiven. If this is not true, if the truth claims of Jesus are not true, then all that we're doing in the church and in our individual lives might give some sense of uh, stability. It might orient us with hope, but ultimately it's meaningless. But if it's true... If Jesus is who he says he is and did what he said he would do, then whatever mission, whatever commands that God gives, we'd be wise to heed. If these things are true, we we should listen to what this guy says has to say and orient our lives to the mission that he presses us on. This calls to mind perhaps C.S. Lewis's uh, most famous Paragraph, which is saying something. C.S. Lewis has a few famous paragraphs. In Mere Christianity, he writes, I'm trying here to prevent anyone from saying the really foolish things that people often say about Jesus. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claims to be God. That is one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level of a man who said he was a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make the choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him the Lord and God. But let us not come with any of the patronizing nonsense about him being a great human teacher. He has not left that open for us. He did not intend to. So, he is God. He has taught and fulfilled God's promises, forgiveness of sins for his people. And as such, he has rightful authority to compel us to leave the driveway in some significant ways. So what did he command? What's the present command? Idea number two, present command. Past reality, Jesus is who he says he is. Present command, verse four. While he was with them, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for the Father's promise, which he said, you've heard me speak about this, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit in a few days. So what's the present command in Acts 1? It's to wait for the Father's promise. Specifically here, it's a promise that Jesus says, I told you this was going to happen at the outset of my earthly ministry. When interaction with John the Baptist makes this claim. John's baptizing you in this way, but there's a day coming when I'm going to send my Holy Spirit to my people. He would immerse his followers in his spirit. You can imagine the impulse to act for these first followers, right? Their leader had just been uh, mercilessly killed. They'd seen his miraculous activity. They'd heard the clear message of the availability of God's kingdom. And now he was dead. He'd entrusted them with mission. There was clear things to do. Imagine it. This kind of folly had happened in our day. The social media outcry. And not to mention, uh, waiting around in Jerusalem uh, doesn't seem like the safest bet for these guys. Uh, 
After all, their, their leader had just been brutally murdered there. Uh, they'd done that to Jesus, and surely his disciples would be set up for harm. Far better to leave town, to hide out, to protect themselves, to do anything but wait. But Jesus knew they needed something. They needed something to get out of the driveway, and it was power. They lacked the power to do it. They had the truth claims, but they didn't have the power at this point. To go at it alone was a plan for destruction. If they didn't have the power, they couldn't be the witnesses that he's going to command them to be following. So he pledged, I'm going to send my power source, the Spirit. And this is going to give these sent ones the ability to do what Jesus entrusts them to do. Here again, we see also this string of promise fulfillment that Luke is tracing in these writings. He's saying, I'm getting ready to do something, and then coming in Acts 2, he's going to fulfill that promise. Another way of validating what I'm saying is true. So then, so what's our so what then out of the driveway? Well, our mission is compelled by the truth claims of Jesus, but our mission is propelled by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's compelled by truth claims about Jesus. It's propelled by the power of the Holy Spirit. Good news for all of us, uh, we're no longer waiting. We're a post-Acts 2 church. He read this passage last week from, first, uh, from 2 Corinthians 1. For every one of God's promises is yes in him. Therefore, through him we say amen to the glory of God. Now it is God who strengthens us together with Christ and who has anointed us. He's put his seal on us and given us his spirit in our hearts as a down payment. What that means then is all those who profess faith, all those who have come to Christ through repentance and belief are sealed with the power of the Holy Spirit. Meaning then, We have all that we need to live out the mission that God has called us to. We're not waiting because we we are given the power source upon our conversion. Let's say this morning that you commissioned me to spend the next six months hiking the Appalachian Trail. Uh, Let's exclude the justified anger that my wife is going to express with me ditching the family for six months to go walk through the woods, right? Right? But on a practical level, you would say, Matt, you don't strike me as one who's well-equipped for the mission. I've never done more than a 10-mile hike in my life. I'm a fairly astute glamper, but camping, particularly in a backpack, that's not something that I'm equipped for. Do I have the right equipment to make it even more? uh, I'd have objections about my ability. Can I do it? Do I care enough? And the answer would most assuredly be no. Far too often, the the same is true for Christians when we talk about the Christian mission. Seemingly, the task put before us is given to the unique ones who have the proper equipment and the right background and the right skill set and drive. But the Bible does not present the Christian mission as an optional add-on for some. Rather, it is the compulsive responsibility for all who are indwelt by God's Spirit. The gifts and the comfort and the truth and the power that the Spirit brings is sufficient for the work that God puts before us. Or said more clearly, if you have the Spirit, then you have the power for mission. It's as simple as that. So then, what is the mission? Verse 6, it's the future mission. When they come together, they ask him, Lord, are you restoring the kingdom of Israel at this time? He said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So they come together in verse 6. This is another scene, in my estimation, of faithful plotting that we pointed to last week. Remember Mary and Joseph's experience and then that of Jesus himself? They're humbly waiting for the fulfillment of a promise that surely they don't fully comprehend. And the question that they ask in verse 6 is, 
quite commonsensical, it seems. Are you going to bring the kingdom now? If these truth claims actually happen, then surely you're going to fix all of this. Is the rule and reign of God coming on earth as it is in heaven right now? Are you going to eradicate Satan's sin and death right now? And Jesus says, not yet. And then he goes further even. He says, it's not even for you to concern yourself with those things. Right? This is the wrong question for you to be asking at this point. It's coming, but the times and dates and logistics are not yours to map out. Instead, in verses 7 and 8, he shifts the focus, in my estimation, from kingdom building to mission expanding. He presses them to do something, to get out of the driveway. He says, you're going to be my witnesses. That's the significant word that frames this entire discussion. In fact, it frames the entire book of Acts. What, What do we see? What's the task of the book of Acts? It's witnessing, testifying to truth. Apart from point one of the past reality, the truth claims of Jesus, this is pointless. But if there is truth to be defended, then witnesses are really important. I mean, this is the frustration of our day, isn't it? We see on our newscast story after story, and it's hard to discern truth. There are a lot of moving pieces. There are people that we love and believe in that are voicing differing opinions, sin-shaping actions, and it's unclear which voices we should listen to. Wouldn't it be really nice to have a faithful insider witness? Say, this is actually truthfully what went down? Here's what really happened. This is what witnesses do. They testify with their words to facts that they know to be true. They testify with their words to facts that they know to be true. And then he he gives that witnessing task a geographical orientation. Gives that witnessing task a geographical orientation. He names places from the location they are in Jerusalem and orients this to the end of the earth. I think it's fine and right to extend this Acts 1-8 call to our own epicenters, where God has his people now, seeing that this is no longer future mission, this is present mission for the church. I'd say it this way, Jerusalem, wherever you are. Judea, wherever you go. Samaria, wherever you don't want to go. And ends of the earth, wherever you can get. Okay? So Jerusalem, wherever you are. Judea, wherever you go. Samaria, wherever you don't want to go. And the ends of the earth, wherever you can get. No surprise in this call, is there, for those of us that are familiar with the scriptures? This rings, the echoes of Genesis 1, 26 through 28, ring true in Acts 1, 8. That God would fill the earth with image-bearing worshipers. The earth would be filled, Habakkuk 2.14, with the knowledge of the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. The final outcome of Revelation 5 and 7, a world filled with people from every tribe, tongue, and nation who would worship God forever. This is what he's calling his people to, his church. So to put a few pieces together for us then, Those who have the Spirit of God, my definition, true Christians, are on a mission to testify with their words to facts they know to be true about Jesus Christ. And they do this wherever they are, wherever they go, wherever they don't want to go, and wherever they can get. That's really cumbersomely worded. So one of the ways we try to frame that up here at Christ Fellowship would be to say we're, we exist to multiply disciples, leaders, and churches, seeing that those who come to Christ in faith and repentance grafted together under biblically qualified leaders in healthy churches. We want to do that from Greenville, South Carolina to the ends of the earth with a clear purpose in mind. Why? So that Jesus is known and worshiped. This is the trip that we're on together, or that we should be on together. 
And that knowledge of Jesus and worship of Jesus starts with us and it sends us out of the driveway on the trip that will consume the entirety of our lives. And it's here that we need to meddle for just a minute. Because then, if this is true, then everything else is packing for the trip. Okay. Everything else is packing for the trip. Now, using that illustration, I think it's good and right to suggest packing for the trip matters. That's not saying it's incidental. That's not saying it doesn't matter. But it is saying that all of the other things that easily consume are preparatory for the trip, for the primacy of the mission. So let me use three illustrations. Health. There's a ton of focus this year on physical health, and rightly so. It is a big deal to be caught in the middle of a global pandemic, avoiding sickness, prolonging life, protecting those that we love is incredibly important. These are meaningful in a way that's really synonymous to packing for a trip. We need to make sure that we're well prepared for the responsibility of witnessing to the truth of Jesus. But friends, in the area of physical health, it is entirely possible to never get out of the driveway, to have a long life, to avoid sickness, but to never get around to the mission that matters most. Or conversely, it's possible to have lives cut short from our perspective, but to have spent those lives in ways that stewarded the years they were entrusted for the primary responsibility of witnessing to the truth of Jesus Christ. You can be right about mask wearing or non-mask wearing, vaccines or lack thereof, and do so in a way that facilitates mission or hinders mission. You can boldly shout about your personal convictions regarding the cultural issues of our day, but remain functionally silent about the forgiveness of sins and peace with God that comes through Jesus Christ. Or take a race. There are good and proper conversations in our day about the inherent dignity of all people and the form that repentance should take for past sins and the best means of creating space where all people have value and worth. We can slice and dice secular theories and label those who slice and dice them a bit differently than we do with pejorative boogeyman terms. But it's possible for this conversation to amount to little more than packing for the trip. Both the negative things we say and the formulations we offer can do little to advance the work of God among every people. We can foster healthy race relations while never pointing beyond race to the unity that is meant to come through the blood of Jesus Christ. Or take politics. There are likely as many opinions as there are people in the room about the events of this week, the implications of the last four years, and the future trajectory of our nation. Perhaps more than ever before in my life, there are opposed viewpoints even within the church, even within our church. Again, in the political conversation, the challenge is to orient ourselves beyond the driveway. Prosperity, peace, international relations, religious liberty, and the like are not the primary mission. They are, or can be, a means of enabling the mission of Jesus to go to the nations. But nations are, and nations have always been, pawns in God's redemptive plan. Case in point, the nation of Israel. There was always a so that attached to the nation of Israel. I'm going to do this for you. I'm going to give you prosperity and blessing and peace in the land. So that, what? So that you'll be a light to the nations. So that my glory will be seen by everyone. Nations are never, and they will never, be an end in themselves. So, we can get a person in the White House, 
We can get the right percentage of the votes to protect our understanding of religious liberty. We can have low gas prices and padded retirement accounts and never get out of the driveway. We could have access to Twitter and Facebook and Parler or any other newfangled online megaphone and use them to testify to the joy, beauty, or hope of found forgiveness found in Jesus Christ or use them to yell at about today's news headlines. In fact, it's actually possible that what we yell from the driveway could hinder our ability to get on the road. Aside from everything else that transpired in the world on January 6th, by statistical count, 154, 937 people died on that day. From all indications, this number of people did not believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. Many of that number had never even heard the good news that comes through faith in Christ. Without him, their eternity is spent in hell. Is it more important for you to yell in the driveway about truth claims that you may or may not know about what transpired on that day, or to orient yourself beyond the driveway to the mission of seeing to it that everyone everywhere has an opportunity to know and worship Jesus Christ. Might we use whatever good and prosperity and peace comes to our nation as a means of seeing to it that the nations hear and respond to Jesus? Lastly, the final hope. What's the final hope of this passage? Verse 9. After he said this, he was taken up as they were watching. Cloud took them out of their sight. While he was going, they were gazing into heaven, and suddenly two men in white clothes stood about them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way that you have seen him going into heaven. Isn't this an interesting parallel? Like the Christmas story. We have angelic appearance that functionally says, don't fear. It's the same thing they said when Jesus was born. Don't, don't fear. Though he pledged that he was going away, see John 15 through 17, he'd actually told them that it was going to be good for him to go away because he was going to uh, send his spirit. Imagine the fear that plagued these followers. He's gone. What's going to happen? Can we do this? Will we do this? And the angel speaks to fear-stricken followers with promises of a second coming. Another day when God will invade this broken world. When it will come again and this time restore his kingdom fully and finally. So what does this, this then mean? So what's the so what? It means that our mission is joyful and hope-filled. It means that our mission is joyful and hope-filled. It means that we have something uh, to look forward to. We're compelled by the truth of Jesus. We're propelled by the power of the Spirit. We're living such that everyone everywhere can have opportunity to know and worship Jesus. And we do so in a way that's joyful and, and hope-filled. Our fears say a lot about the answer that our lives are giving to the question that I ask at the beginning of the sermon. What mission are you on? The angel's promise addressed fears associated with the witnessing mission of the people of God to the ends of the earth. It did not seemingly address near-present fears that would have been good and right for them to have. Witnesses of Jesus are going to need the hope that comes from the promise of the return of Christ. So he says, you can have confidence. You can have confidence that the Spirit is with you. This echoes in my mind the words of Matthew 28. How does the Great Commission end? I'm with you always, even till the end of the earth. And we can have confidence that Jesus is going to return. If this is true, that he came one time, we can have confidence that he's going to return again. So then the question for January 10th, 2021 followers is, do, do those words of hope, actually bring joy to your fears. 
Because there's no, no doubt, casual look around us, people are afraid. It's a dark day and there's no shortage of matters to get bent out of shape over. But it's a telling factor. Let's see how to frame this. It's telling for us to, what, what message actually calms my fears. And that's going to tell me where my functional hope is, where my functional savior is. So if the promise of the Spirit and the promise of the return of Christ doesn't calm your fears, then it leads to a, probably a pressing concern for you. You might be stuck in the driveway. Because driveway concerns uh, don't get softened uh, by these words of future hope and promise. But uh, for those who are on the road, on the mission, the fact that we have the Spirit's presence and the finality of the future return of Christ is comforting. It's fear alleviating. So friends, my assumption is going to be a lot of you have oriented yourself to beyond the driveway at times. But I think New Year's uh, require kind of reorientation to that, reassessment of, am I sitting in the driveway bantering about things that aren't actually promoting mission? I mean, I did it with health and race and politics. We could have extrapolated that to a whole assortment of cares and concerns that you have. Pick it. That are, that are driveway matters. So let's take a minute um, even, I mean, it's good for me as well, just to kind of still ourselves and reflect. Am I on the right trip? Am I concerned about the right things? Am I, am I using driveway conversations to get me on the road? What do I need to ask forgiveness for? And what do I need to ask the Spirit to help me grow in? And after a few minutes of silent reflection, I'll voice a prayer for us and then we'll stand and sing to finish our service. Father, we need your Spirit's help to stay committed to the mission that you've entrusted to your people. There's, there's a lot of packing to do in our day. A lot of concerns and lists and uh, voices that we feel compelled uh, to share and speak into. Father, would you protect us from living lives that amount to sitting in the driveway preparing for a trip that we never go on? Would you, by, by your Spirit's power, give us the, the ability to rightly prioritize your mission to the ends of the earth? Would you protect us from triviality? Uh, protect us from squandering healthy years? We, we know that as we read your scriptures, it's those with prosperity, those with blessing, that, that often are the most difficult to humble themselves, to embrace the kingdom, to be about the mission. 
So we, we know that the task is difficult for all of us. But we're thankful that we are given your spirit. We're thankful that that spirit through your word has good effect, even in moments like this, of poking at our heart, pointing us to something bigger than what's weighing heavy on us in this moment. We pray that whatever years you give us, whatever peace or lack thereof our nation experiences, whoever is in positions of power or whoever is not, whatever sources of conflict we face, we pray that your providential hand would use those to foster your mission that Jesus would be known and worshipped around the world. And we pray that you would give us the wisdom to step into that mission with the years that you've allotted to us. As we uh, orient our hearts to that task, uh, would you use the songs that we sing, the words that we share together to, um, to give us firmer conviction on the truth of Jesus and the necessity of the mission? And then would you fling us wherever you want to for that work? We ask that for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. The band's going to come now and lead us. If you want to uh, take a moment to reflect on the text, and Walker will invite us to sing uh, before we're dismissed.